Welcome everybody to our program. This is North Country Live. Uh, my name is Chris Knight. I'm the communications director at North Country Community College. Um, we're excited to have you all with us tonight. I want to just talk for a little bit uh, about North Country Live before we introduce our guests tonight. For those of you that uh, have been to a couple of our programs already, um, this will be uh, a repeat. But for those of you that might be new to North Country Live, I just want to talk a little bit about how we started. So um, you know, at the outset of the COVID pandemic, uh, more than a year ago, the college was looking for ways to try and engage with our communities while we were all still sort of uh, quarantining or homebound um, and to reach out into our communities in ways that we have always done, um, but just do it via Zoom and other ways. So we launched North Country Live with a mission to do that, to spark some conversation, present some programs that enrich our communities. And through a lot of different platforms, webinars, panel discussions, presentations, we've provided more than 30 programs so far on all kinds of topics, the environment, wellness, um, great outdoors. We've had a lot of different history programs, uh, Black history in the Adirondacks. We had a program on the history of indigenous peoples of the Akwesasne and St. Regis Mohawk tribes. Um, so those are just a few of the topics that we've covered through the series so far. This fall semester of programs um, is focused on the arts and music. Uh, I do wanna mention that this semester's programs are sponsored by the North Country Community College Foundation. I'll talk a little bit about them at the end of the program. Um, and you can watch all of our programs on our YouTube channel or the North Country Live page, which is nccc.edu slash live. Uh, we'll be recording tonight's program so you can share it with others and watch it again. Um, before we introduce our guests, I do want to mention that we um, will ask everyone to stay muted during the program. Um, but if you have questions, um, if you have comments, if you want to say that was amazing, <laughs> which I think there'll be a lot of that going on tonight, once um, you know we hear from Dan and Peggy, feel free to use the chat function for that purpose. Um, and then at the end of the program, we'll save some time to try and get to the questions um, that you might have about uh, what we're talking about. So um, tonight's program is titled Exploring Traditional Adirondack Music. So we're privileged to welcome two very special guests to North Country Live, Peggy Lynn. Hi, Peggy. Hi. And Dan Bergerin. Hi, Dan. Hi, friends. I want to just tell you a little bit about Peggy and Dan um, before we start. Uh, Peggy Lynn earned a degree in forestry from Paul Smith's College, and there her love of the Adirondacks began. Uh, while raising a family in Paul Smith's, she started writing songs inspired by the region and the strong women who led the way. Her song, Lydia, about Paul Smith's wife is one of her best known ballads. Peggy has been writing, recording, and performing traditional and original songs of the Adirondacks for over 30 years. She and her husband, Dan Duggan, uh, perform in a trio with Dan Bergeron called Jam Crackers, named for the river drivers who broke up log jams here in the mountains. Um, so that's a little bit about Peggy. And now um, Dan, Dan Bergeron's a traditional based songsmith who writes with honesty, humor, and a strong sense of place. His songs explore the many dimensions of home, hardworking mm -hmm. folks, taking care of our planet and each other. Dan's roots are firmly in the Adirondacks. He was raised on land that had been in the family for five generations, but his music has branched out across many borders. He's entertained audiences overseas, and throughout New York State since 1973. Uh, and an award-winning musician and educator, Dan held various jobs before devoting his life to music full-time. He worked in the woods with a forest ranger and a surveyor, as a radio producer, writer, and announcer for the American Forces Network Europe, professor of audio and radio studies for 27 years at the State University of New York at Fredonia, where he was also a sound designer for theater and dance, an executive producer of numerous public radio programs. Uh, Dan is currently trustee emeritus of Great Camp Sagamore, co-host and co-producer of Cafe Lina's weekly online children's program, Folk Club Kids. And he's also, as we mentioned, a member of the trio Jam Crackers with Peggy Lynn and Dan Duggan. And he owns Sleeping Giant Records, which has produced over 20 al albums of original and traditional folk music. So welcome to you both again. Um, and I do want to, uh, you know, start with um, a little bit about, you know, what we're talking about tonight and what the topic is, um, and that is, you know, exploring traditional Adirondack music. And I'd like to ask you each maybe to start off by 
sort of trying to help us define that a little bit. You know, what is traditional Adirondack music? Is is that debatable? Is there a clear definition? And you know, where where did it all kind of start? I think it does start. Um, it started when people settled here, or even as people were began to travel through uh, the Adirondack Mountains. Um, I, people always had their music with them, <laughs> um, even if they didn't have instruments, uh, which many of them did by the time they started settling here in the Adirondacks. Um, and so they all had their, their songs and their stories that they passed down from generation to generation. Every um, set of parents had, had lullabies. Everyone had work songs to coordinate efforts together. Um, and people had seasonal songs and they had their, their spirituals, um, their, their songs of faith. Um, so everyone who came brought their, brought their music and that's, that's where it began. I think everyone's perspective is different on how you define it. <laughs> the word define, I, I shy away from, but from my perspective, it, it is um, the folk music by, sung by regular people or played um, by, by just everyday people in their everyday lives not something they got paid for or were hired to do, but just um, the music that accompanied what they were doing. And so we see that people came for a lot of different reasons. One of the biggest reasons they came to the Adirondacks early on was to um, lumber, to cut down the trees, um, even during the 18th century, there were people coming up through the Adirondacks looking for tall, straight pine trees to use as the masts of ships and, you know, putting a blaze on the side of them for King George. Um, and so, you know, people from uh, the British Isles were coming here and uh, people were coming down from French speaking Canada to the to the lumber camps. And of course, those, those people working hard and doing, doing difficult, dangerous work, uh, they had their songs. Um, so they, they sang and, and of course, they, they would localize the songs to their own uh, lumber camp. They would speak of the local river that they were driving logs down. They would talk about the, the irascible uh, lumber camp crew boss, you know, who was a nasty man and they liked to see him get what was coming to him. <laughs> but they would, it, the song might have started in the Great Lakes or up in Quebec, but um, when it came to this area, it would it would be localized as to um, the conditions and the uh, the experiences of those people. And most of the songs were verse and chorus, so that um, everyone could join in on part of it. That way, you knew that people were still listening as it went along. And um, and people learned learned the songs more quickly that way because they were memorable, simple melodies usually not not terribly complicated. So um, yeah, so a, a wealth of the traditional um, song repertoire that we know of came from those lumber camps. Um, and Dan, should I go ahead and, and sing one of those or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So. I don't think okay. anybody's going to say no, Peggy. <laughs>
Um, I, I, I don't want to fill up all the time myself, but uh, what they would do is the loggers before we had, you know, chainsaws and, and mechanization and, and um, trucks and skitters and things like that, they would use cross cut saws and go out and mostly cut down trees in the winter time. And they would pile them up, use horses to drag them out of the woods and they would pile them up next to a river and then wait for spring. They would wait for spring for the snow to start melting and the level of the waters to rise in the rivers. And then they would push the logs into the rivers and hopefully get them downstream to where there would be sawmills down below in places like Glens Falls. And invariably, there would be rocks in the rivers and the current would take them in different directions and the logs would start to jam up on each other and pile up into big mountains of log jams. And so they, the log drivers would need to go out onto the logs with their caulk boots, um, nail ends sticking out through the bottom of their boots and try to use these long metal pipe poles to get those logs rolling again down the river. And the logs were actually branded on the ends by the lumber companies that owned them, just as cattle are, are also branded. And so um, most of the river drivers did not know how to swim. And the water was so cold that it really didn't matter that they didn't know how to swim. Um, but in, and it was very dangerous work, but they, they dared it because it was great money and they could cut logs down in the winter and then do the river drives in the spring and then hunt and fish all, all winter, all summer and have that summertime off more likely. So um, this is a song about river driving and um, I think it's, we think it's one of those that got localized, um, probably came from the Great Lakes area where their jam boats um, had actual sails on them. Here in the Adirondacks, the jam boat was just a flat bottomed wooden boat that they pushed out into the river with their long metal pike poles. And then they would get there and they would work on the jam from the boat with their pike pole to try and get the right strategic log rolling down in the current again. And so uh, this is called Juber Jew, which is how they referred to the, the dance that these river drivers did on the logs as they were out there uh, spinning those logs in that ice cold river. He said he's been a boatsman for 16 years before. He run the Hudson River where her thunder tore its pour. He dread nor feared no danger while in his own canoe. He run the Hudson River and the Indian River. Watch her, catch her, jump her, do, do, do. Give her the wind and let her go if Joe can shove her through. You ought to heard them howling as they went floating by. With the face the color of snow, my boys, and a tear in every eye. It was on a Sunday morning, just at the hour of ten. Joe Thomas and his boat crew, their business did begin. Well, he slammed his boat against the jam and split her bow in two. And soon she filled with water and washed away the brew. Watch her, catch her, jump her, do, do. Give her the wind and let her go if Joe can shove 
Wonderful. Peggy, I, I love that you mentioned uh, lullabies because I think um, it's, it's quite possible that lullabies were the very first um, examples of, even before human speech, uh, there were lullabies. Um, here's, a, here's a visual aid to go along with that uh, Juber Jew. <laughs> wow some some river drivers um i think uh i want to underline a couple of things that peggy said uh one about learning things by ear um to me that's a, a key to folk music and certainly to adirondack music you you learn something by ear and eventually you repeat it. Uh, you learned it well enough that you can sing along. And any musician who sings in coffee houses knows um, how good it feels to have an audience sing along with a chorus and how it brings people together. Uh, most people in an audience don't know every other person in that audience and yet they share an experience for the time they're there, the hour or the 90 minutes that they're there, um, sharing the music of any performer or group. And one of the key elements, as Peggy said, of folk music is to have a chorus, something that everybody can join in on. And it's like, it's almost like the moral of a story that gets repeated and repeated. And it takes on different nuances after each chapter of the story, after each, after each verse. And by the end of the song, you have a command of that uh, chorus and you've been singing it, maybe with friends at your table, but also with people uh, across the room who you've never met or haven't met yet. Um, and then the idea of localizing it uh, is another thing I wanted to underline. Um, to me, that's the very essence of of folk music. I wrote a song once. Uh, I was with my nephews and we were walking in the woods uh, during hunting season. I told them how we had to be careful. Uh, not only were we wearing uh, bright red jackets, but we wanted to be sure to let uh, any possible hunters out there know that we were humans and not uh, wildlife. And so we made up this song and each verse warned a different animal. Um, be careful or Johnny Hunter will find you quick and you'll wind up in a stew. Um, and I've heard other people make up their own verses and make the song their own. And that 
that is um, again the essence of, of folk music. Uh, I want to mention John Galusha, um, a traditional folk musician. Here's a picture of John on 14th Road in in Minerva, where he lived and uh, lived a long life. He he died the year after I was born, uh, 1950, and many say that he knew hundreds of songs, and it was due to Essex County historian Marjorie Lansing Porter, who would travel from uh, community to community and go up this road and ask if, do you, have, do you know any old songs? Do your neighbors know any old songs? And they would direct her and she would record them on a, on a primitive disc uh, recording machine. And she met John Galusha on 14th Road in Minerva. And I, I learned that he knew so many songs, hundreds of songs, because he worked in the lumber woods. And so from his teenage years through his adult years, he learned and repeated and sang the songs like Peggy just sang about Juber Jew or the Lumberman's Alphabet or Once More a Lumbering Go. Um, but his repertoire also included um, British ballads that his grandparents had carried over from um, the British Isles and that his parents sang and that he learned to sing and he shared those. Uh, so all songs were not about uh, working in the woods. Um, they could be any songs that might entertain. And then the third category of songs that John Galusha had were Civil War songs. Uh, he had two uh, brothers, older brothers. Uh, one did not come home from the Civil War and another one did and with him he brought a handful of Civil War songs. So for the rest of his life, John Galusha in Minerva sang these Civil War songs. And there's a book, Traditional American Folk Music, a pretty thick book. It's like a, it's like hefty, like a phone book. And the chapter on New York State folk music is devoted almost entirely to John Galusha. Um, another person who uh, Peggy and I have are grateful <laughs> that she existed, grateful that she wrote, um, is Jean Robert Foster, who was born Julia Oliver. Her dad was a, a lumberjack. Her mom had been a school teacher before raising a family. Um, my mother handed me Jean Robert Foster's book of um, her poetry, which is more storytelling than, than poetry, handed me this in um, 1986 when it came out. And she started to point to different people and saying, that's our family. That's our family. Um, and Thanks to this, I, I learned more about my own family history. Um, my great-great-grandparents came from Ireland. Um, they landed in New York, came up the Hudson, worked in Troy for about four or five years to make enough money in the iron foundry so that when they came up to Minerva, and settled in Irish town, they had enough money to buy land. Um, so just a, a piece of Jean Robert Foster's um, story about being neighbors in those times. The word neighbor don't mean much to most folks, not unless you live back in the North Woods. The way things are going, there won't be woods very long or wilderness. It'll be imitation ranches and ski runs and places called by names that the folks who lived there years and years ago never heard of. 
but lovely things vanish. There my neighborhood was along Trout Brook. He climbed the long hill to the Wilson Farms. The road divided here on the, old, on the high fork old man Wamsley lived. You see, the Wilsons and Wamsleys were Irish. I heard them sing the famine song their fathers had brought here. Oh, the praties, they grow small over here, over here. Oh, the praties, they grow small and they're failing in the fall. But we eat them skins and all over here, over here. We are stumbling in the dust over here, over here. We are stumbling in the dust, but the Lord in whom we trust will give us crumb for crust over here, over here. It's the My music song. teacher, Helen Barnes, uh, in probably when I was in sixth or seventh grade, um, she knew I was learning guitar uh, and she gave me a book of folk songs and she pointed out this one called Prades, which is potatoes. And it was sung, of course, uh, during uh, the potato famines and was the reason why so many came to this country and so many came to the town of Minerva. There's a section of Minerva called Irish Town. And she wanted me to learn that song. And it wasn't until years later that I, it hit me as I was reading that poem by Jean Robert Foster, um, talking about the Wilsons and the Walmsleys brought that song with them uh, when they settled in Minerva. Um, Thanks to this woman, Mar um, Marjorie Lansing Porter. She's the, uh, she was a journalist um, and the Essex County historian who recorded uh, John Galusha in Minerva, but she recorded people uh, all over the North Country and that's what I discovered in 1975 when I got out of the army and, and came back to Minerva was this collection in the SUNY Plattsburgh Library. And back, back then I listened to reel-to-reel -reel tapes and now it's all been digitized um, thanks to a, a friend of ours, um, Kathy Supple. It's been digitized and you can go to uh, the library the, the archives in the SUNY Plattsburgh Library and hear recordings of John Galusha and um, all these old folks singing these wonderful, wonderful old songs. Um, let's, let's move on to uh, another question from you, Chris, or if Peggy wants to add on now. You know, I was thinking, I know this is kind of near and dear to Peggy, but, you know, we talked a lot about the lumbermen and the the men working in the woods, but you know, women, women's voices, women's stories play a big part of traditional Ad Adirondack music as well. Um, Peggy, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and I know that's something that has been you've studied, you've you've had a passion for that, right? And you're muted, Peggy, if you want to unmute. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, because women were not necessarily gathering other than in church um, to sing with each other, to sing in big groups um, in you know in the eighteen hundreds at least, um, their their songs um, were more private with the with the family, the, the lullabies we talked about, the work songs, the seasonal songs. Um, and so within their families, they always had 
they always had singing and there were women of course who who played instruments um, and probably carried on the the traditional tunes um, there were kitchen dances um, through the late 1800s for which women and men would play fiddle guitar banjo maybe a hammered dulcimer which was called the the lumberman's piano. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things we're trying to do that musicians have have tried to do is to set some of the, the women's voices in in writing to music so that we can carry forth their perspectives. Um, We've written some ballads about some strong Adirondack women, um, but also have set some of their writing to a tune so that we can sing it for people and they can get to know who this person was. Dan Berger has a wonderful song called Miss Cole, which is based on a poem by Jean Robert Foster. Um, and uh, Jean Robert Foster's mother was also a poet, and her pen name was Lucia Olivier. She wrote a very short poem about never being allowed to go unchaperoned, to just wander in the wilderness. So women were pretty much expected to be accompanied by a family member, um, men always had a reason for wandering in the woods. It was called hunting. But, but women often were con constrained to the home. And so she wrote this poem about a woman on her deathbed wishing that she'd been able to get out and just enjoy wandering and um, it's about a woman named Mary Jane, and so I, I set it to music, and um, I hope that it will be traditional someday when my grandchild sings it. <laughs> um, it's, it's very short. Mary Jane lay dying in the house she lived in all her life. Every day among her family, as a mother and a wife, she'd been ushered, watched, and chaperoned, never once to spend the day alone. Who knows what joy she might have known on a solitary flight. Her dreams took her to wander to the daisy meadow hills, to the moonlit shimmering river where she swam and drank her fill. So when her daughter in law, who was not so dear, sighed and said her time was drawing near. Mary Jane just told her not to fear. At least she'd finally be alone. That's beautiful. So if you're driving through Lake Clear right now, you're getting a real <laughs> amazing performance. No, I interrupted you. Go ahead, Peggy. I just like to, to always remind people that there were women here in the Adirondacks. They came to enjoy hiking, hunting, fishing, camping out of doors. They came to take the cure from tuberculosis. They, they came to work. They worked in hotels and uh, they, they had borders that they put up. So there were, there were plenty of women here in the earliest days. 
And so we like to give them voices. And, and thank you for doing that and, you know, preserving that. Um, that's really special. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, Jean Robert Foster uh, gave voice to her dad. Um, I didn't understand the connection at first. In uh, one of her books of poems, there were, in the back were some lyrics, poems that looked like song lyrics, and uh, but they were sung from a male perspective. And when I consulted with the editor of the, the book, Noel Readinger Johnson, she said yes, um, that Jean Robert Foster had um, memorialized her dad by capturing some of those lyrics of songs that he used to sing. And one of them was called River Drivin' on the Sack and Dog. And the lines in the, in the song, or as it appeared on the page, a poem, uh, were so vivid that instantly I was provoked to put a melody to it. And I'll never know what the original melody was, what may have been sung in a lumber camp at the end of a long, hard day. Um, but I'll just do a couple of, a couple of verses of this. River driving on the sack and dog, riding on a slippery log, sleeping in a frozen bog. My girl's waiting for me. And whenever I sing it, I picture these guys with their eyes at half mast after a full day of work, after a dinner, and they're ready to roll into their bunks and someone gets out a, a fiddle or a ballad, something they can join in on that last line. Hard boiled eggs three times a day. Wet as beavers we hit the hay. Not much sleep but good big pay. My girl's waiting for me. Big French Joe and I went out to break the jam, then I heard him shout. Prenez garde, then the jam went out. My girl's waiting for me. Big French Joe, the logs drowned him. He'd no chance to fight and swim. The logs jammed up to the river's rim. My girl's waiting for me. His girl come to me and cry. If he's dead, then I shall die. Ma petite, he used to sigh. My girl's waiting for me. We will find him down below. Round the bend where the water is slow. Floating with his pike in tow. My girl's waiting for me. Ma petite will wring her hand. When we scrape that yellow sand And lay him down by the river strand My girl's waiting for me One more night and one more day The logs will reach the river bay I'll skin off these togs and then I'll say my girl's waiting for me. My girl's waiting for me. That's wonderful. So much, uh, you can just paint a picture, you know, uh, with those words. It's, uh, you know, we talk about music, but it's art and it, you know, that's what it is painting that picture for us of that time. And you know, those what... words, that, that story told in words is what's important in it. I've often been asked, what's the difference between country western um, 
music and, and folk music. Um, yes, there are stories told in, in country music, but for a lot of uh, country songs, there are people working eight hours a day at publishing houses in Nashville and other places, and their job is to write a hit for somebody. Uh, and then the producer of that song, their job is to create a hit. So anything you can do with the instrumentation uh, that surrounds the musician uh, singing that song, it all has to serve, will it be a hit? Will it sell more than any other song that week? And I don't think that's the intention of any of the folk musicians I've ever uh, run into, certainly not uh, Peggy, it's sharing a story and the story comes first. Or as a friend of mine uh, in Canada, uh, Ian Robb said, a folk musician gets behind the song, not in front of it. That's great. I also wanted to talk about um, Native American music here in the Adirondacks. I'm sure when Chris, you had um, people presenting about um, history of Native Americans here in the Adirondacks, um, they probably mentioned how uh, perception has changed with improved archeological techniques. Um, we're finding that um, Native peoples not only went through here in hunting parties, but settled, lived, lived here. Um, and uh, of course, they had they had their music. Um, you know, the the drums, the 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 rattles, the flutes, um, the songs, the stories. Um, we are we are aware of two two families um, that are preserving the tradition of, um, of folk music. Um, the Bruchak family who have Ndakana um, Outdoor Educational Center. Um, Joe Bruchak joined us for a folk theater production called The Visitors, which was all about Adirondack traditional music. Um, and shared a welcoming song there. Um, his two sons, James and Jesse, also are, are preserving the language of the Abenaki people and, uh, and, the, and the songs as well. And here up in the Northern Adirondacks in Ontario, the Fadden family, Ray Fadden and his son, John, and uh, his son, Dave, are, you know, preserving language and stories, and I'm sure songs as well. So um, they, they have an important part of our, of our culture here. Peggy, when, uh, when Pete Seeger tried to have a, well, didn't, tr he tried and he su succeeded in having a folk festival in Scroon Lake in 1950. Um, he invited Ray Fadden to come to Scroon Lake, and Ray brought some of the students um, uh, from um, Anchiota, and he sang Pete a song that Pete, this is in 1950, he, that, that Pete put on an album later called Champlain Valley Songs. Half of them were from the Adirondacks, and half of them were from Vermont, and it was the Seneca Canoe Song. Iowa Jane, Iowa Jane, Iowa Jane, yo ho, hey, Iowa Jane, Iowa Jane. And Pete sang that the rest of his life, thanks to Ray Fadden. That's great. You know, we, um, we've been talking about the roots of of this kind of music of, of traditional Adirondack music. Um, 
you know, when, when would you each say, or, you know, when was kind of the heyday, you know, and, and how, you know, was that not too long ago or how did that change, you know, over time, you know, as we, when did that transition start to happen where, you know, you didn't start to hear this kind of music as much. Um, I honestly think the heyday is right now, or we're approaching it, because there have never been more musicians sharing uh, songs and stories of the Adirondacks, and there has never been uh, more support uh, from public radio. Um, when I was a teenager, none of this existed. North Country Public Radio having a weekly folk show. Um, WAMC out of Albany having a weekly folk show on Saturday night. Vermont Public Radio having a weekly folk show on, on Sunday night. And you don't even need uh, a radio. You can listen on your computer. And there are all these venues that support and uh, uh, play folk music. Um, the Indian Lake Central School has a Heritage Week that's been going on for uh, a couple of decades now, uh, where they Bill Smith comes and tells stories, and Peggy comes and and I come and and we help with song songwriting. I think it's never been richer, and maybe it'll continue to grow, but at the same time, you could stop a uh, hundred people on the street in Albany or Plattsburgh and ask them about Adirondack folk music and they'll say, what? <laughs> we might be too close to it in doing it to actually know how pervasive it is. Because where we go, there are people mostly who have come to hear us and share music with us and they're all people we're, we're singing to the choir <laughs> so it's it's hard to know what right i can only compare it to uh when i first started performing uh in 1975 when i got out of the army and uh people wanted rock and roll or country and there was nowhere to play folk music except Cafe Lena in Saratoga Springs. And that's why you were working in the woods, right? I mean, <laughs> but in the reality, you couldn't make a life of it then. No. But you have since. I mean, that's evidence that it's really stronger than ever now, do you think? I agree, but at the same time, I agree with Peggy. We are a little too close to it to... Yeah. Um, see the curve accurately. I think of uh, a woman named Joan Payne, who lived in Inlet, who introduced Dan Berger and, and I, and later introduced me to Dan Duggan, um, who started an organization called Adirondack Discovery, because she felt like there was not enough interpretation of the Adirondacks, of Adirondack history and natural history. And so she started this organization that held free programs open to the public. And she asked all kinds of people to lead these outings, lead hikes. And she asked us to, you know, perform music of the Adirondacks. And after 25 years, she said, there are so many more venues now, so many more presenters of this Adirondack culture than there used to be. And, and Adirondack discovery isn't as needed as it was when we started. I'd like to give a tip of the hat to a couple of others. Um, um, in Bolton Landing, there was a kindergarten teacher who when she retired, um, started a, a folk festival in, in Bolton Landing. It lasted, I don't know, uh, eight or nine, ten years, Cindy Farbaniak. Um, and 
she did it for the love of it. She wasn't paid a cent. Um, she got some funds to help pay for musicians to come. Um, uh, Tawny, uh, Traditional Arts in Upstate New York, which is headquartered in, in Canton, um, they do wonderful work that supports uh, traditional arts of all kinds, not just music and storytelling. And they have a website called W is for Wood. Wild, woods or Wildwoods. And you can uh, you can go to that and hear hear stories about some of the people that Peggy and I have been talking about, and hear little hear clips. Um, and it, just go to Traditional Arts in Upstate New York website, and you'll find your way to uh, the W is for Woods. Um, uh, who else? Oh, Crandall Library has a folk life center uh, that Todd DeGarmo runs, and it's not just folk music, but folk life uh, of all kinds. Uh, balsam pillow making, um, storytelling, and the Scroon Lake Arts Council. I think we're into the 33rd year of, folk of a annual folk festival that's free to the public um, that the Arts Council in Scroon Lake uh, makes available. So there are a lot of people and I can't forget Great Camp Sagamore in Racket Lake that started a program called Roots and Branches. Peggy, you want to say a word about Roots and Branches? Roots and Branches is an effort to bring young people into be more engaged with traditional Adirondack music. Um, Barbara Glazer, one of the um, emeritus trustees of Great Camp, Camp Sagamore, one of the founders of the Institute said, well, what will happen when, you know, Peggy and Dan and Dan and, and John and Trish are not here to lead us in song? <laughs> we need young people carrying on the tradition. And so um, for the last several years in June, we've had a weekend where we invite young people um, to come and play the music with us to learn some songs, to uh, learn some traditional fiddle tunes. And uh, it's the program is completely uh, scholarship funded. So it's a free weekend for the, the young people who come. And uh, it's, it's a great time. We've, we've really gotten to know some wonderful young musicians through that. And we, it gives us hope for the future. I want to remind folks that if they'd like to ask a question uh, in the chat, feel free to do so. Uh, just a couple of folks have posted the, you know, the Tawny uh, website that you were talking about, Dan. Um, and a comment here from Denise Hotaling says, I think Taylor Swift recording folklore in upstate New York has piqued the interest of an entirely new young generation. My daughter is 16 and enjoyed listening to the Visitors album and compared it to Taylor Swift's album. That's pretty cool. And earlier, um, I did want to give a shout out to Kim Duffy who posted the link to the uh, Marjorie Lansing Porter documentary from 2014 that won an Emmy, um, you know, which um, people could look up to songs to keep. Um, and she posted the link to a, an NCPR story about that as well. That's another um, thing you can check out if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more. We've got a couple minutes left. I don't see anything else in the chat right now. Would we, um, any other things that come to mind or any other uh, songs that might come to mind to kind of wind us down? Peggy or Dan? I'm game. Peggy, do you have something? I think you should sing Here's to You, Dan. While it's not a traditional song, it, it gives you the history of the Adirondack in a three-minute song, which is wonderful. And it has a singable chorus, so I will mute 
and I'll sing the harmony and you can just pretend I'm singing. Okay. So you can hear me. Love it. I hope everyone while they're muted can uh, can sing harmony on the chorus here. We'll all, we'll all sound great and mute. The harmony will be beautiful. The Algonquin and the Iroquois, natives of the land, they understood the balance between nature and man. Then the trappers and explorers, long since laid to rest, left us a path to follow to that northern wilderness. Here's to you, all the mountain people, here's to you. Each woman, man, and child, here's to you, who call the Adirondacks your home forever wild. Communities grew up around the military forts. With water travel more secure, some settle lakeside ports. Pioneers from New England, across the lake they came. And settle down the farm, the western shore of Lake Champlain. Here's to you, all the mountain people, here's to you. Each woman, man, and child, here's to you. Who call the Adirondacks your home forever wild. Quebecois. And Irish immigrants came here to cut the pine. Others worked the forge and furnace and dug iron ore in the mines. The mining and the lumber brought new roads to carry goods. The railroads and the steamers brought more people to the woods. Here's to you, all the mountain people, here's to you. Each woman, man, and child, here's to you, who call the Adirondacks your home forever wild. The ups and downs throughout the years are seen in every face. You feel the seasons come and go and live a natural pace. That's life in these mountains, just look at history. They were here long before us, and they'll outlast you and me. Here's to you, all the mountain people, here's to you. Each woman, man, and child, here's to you, who call the Adirondacks your home forever wild. Our home forever. We can all clap, unmute and clap on that one. <laughs> so great. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. As we as we kind of close here and a lot of nice accolades for you both in the chat. I want to ask, are you, you know, now given what the state of the world is, are you either of you out performing these days, uh, doing things? In public, uh, talk. Can you talk a little bit about you know where you've been, what you're doing? We in are terms. mostly outdoor concerts. Um, some people, some venues have opened up to in you know face to face audiences, but with distancing, um, some are requiring uh, vaccination proof um, and masking. So. We hope that that will be enough and that we can continue. Um, we were scheduled to play for uh, first night in Saranac Lake this year and they just had to cancel it. So um, we hope Bummer. the following year we'll, we'll be back. Um, we just scheduled a concert for Jam Crackers in the spring in May. I think it's the seventh, Dan. Right, right. We're going to be at Lake Placid Center for the Arts. 
as a benefit concert for Play ADK, which is a, um, an upcoming uh, children's museum right in the heart of uh, Saranac Lake. That's great. That's so, exciting. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's different. It, we're better than where we were a year ago, obviously. Um, right. Some things are happening. And we had a couple of you, concerts Dan? a year ago when uh, we sang to a TV camera. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And uh, up in in Racket Lake, we uh, set up on a porch of a boathouse and the audience came in their boats. Um, so this past summer was a little a little better, but everyone's still playing it safe. And uh, I think the only winter thing we have is uh, for old songs uh, at the beginning of is that the beginning of December? Yes. Yeah. And they are streaming in addition to having a face-to-face -face concert. So if the concert cannot happen face-to-face -face because we have to shut things down again, they will still stream it. So, and we'll be in the, in the same place so you can hear the harmonies. <laughs> That's great. And we've all been getting used to this, talking to one another, using uh, the camera on the computer. Um, and keeping us, uh, keeping us from beating our head on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Cabin fever is another Adirondack traditional uh, <laughs> subject, isn't it? And this yeah. is helping to, to cure that a bit, I'm sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, yeah, I want to thank you both for uh, for doing this for us, uh, you know, and, and allowing us to come into your homes this evening and in, to, in turn, uh, you know, you uh, spending your time and, and getting into so many people's homes in this way, um, a little different and, and uh, maybe not the, you know, the sound quality of Radio City, but it sounded pretty awesome to me from where I'm, I'm sitting here. So Dan, thank you, Peggy. Thank you for coordinating it and to all the folks who, who joined us tonight. It was thank great. You. Thanks for the opportunity to share our thoughts on traditional Adirondack music. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to mention to people again that we recorded this program. So if you know anyone who might be interested in, in, in uh, learning more about it or enjoying it, we'll have it on that North Country Live page on our website uh, by tomorrow and also on our the college's YouTube channel. Um, so you can check it out there. Uh, I also want to thank again our sponsor, which is the North Country Community College Foundation. Um, it's the philanthropic arm of the college. Uh, provides opportunities for alumni and students and faculty and staff and our communities to invest in the college and invest in our um, future and in our students here, whether that's through, you know, building facility upgrades, through scholarships to students and a whole lot more. Um, and you can learn a lot more about the college's foundation by visiting the about tab on our website, which is uh, nccc.edu. Uh, next week is our last edition of North Country Live for the fall semester. We're going to be talking about something that I know is near and dear to probably everyone else in this room, which is growing the music scene in your community, um, whether it's traditional Adirondack music, all kinds of styles. Um, we've got some, um, some guests from different communities around the park who are going to talk a little bit about what they're doing to grow the music scene in their, in their community. So I hope you can tune in at uh, the same time next week for that. Dan, Peggy, thank you once again. It was a thank joy. You. Thank you, Chris. Pleasure. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Peggy.